Man, I love Luke. I'm going to tell you what, I know a lot of y'all, uh, we always tease Luke because we feel like he should be up here a lot more. Let me just tell you, man, Luke is a gift to you guys. He is an incredible gift to this church. And uh, I, if I had time, I'd tell you all the different ways that he just provides so much of what we need in leadership here. But I love Luke. He's one of my best friends. I'm a little bit offended right now because I won the fantasy football last year, but I'll get past that. <laughs> I do know something about football. But in honor of Luke, the thing I know about Luke is I'm pretty sure Luke was born in the wrong time frame. Like, I think he was supposed to have been born during the days of the wild, wild west. And somehow the angels got the wires crossed and he ended up being born now. But, you know, in honor of that, I've got a really good cowboy story. And I was like, I found it this week. I was like, man, I'm going to share that story with you guys in honor of Luke. It's really good. It's this cowboy out in Texas. And uh, he walks into a bar one evening, goes up to the bartender, and he orders three draft beers. So the bartender pours his draft beers, puts them on a tray for him, and he takes them. And he goes to a booth, and he sits down by himself. And bartender thought, well, that's odd. And he starts drinking the beer. So he takes a sip out of this one, puts it down. Takes a sip out of this one, puts it down. Takes a sip out of this one, puts it down. And he keeps doing it like that until all three are gone. And when he's done, he comes back up, gives the bartender the tray with the empty glasses. Hey, man, thank you so much. The bartender's like, hey, I, I noticed that like, you're by yourself. He said, yeah. He said, well, you know, the moment I pour those beers, they start going flat. So why don't you just drink one and, and then come get another one and, you know, do it like that. It'd be fresher and a much better experience for you. He goes, well, he said, there's a reason I'm doing that. He said, you know, me and my brothers are super tight, have been our whole life. And, and so part of what we did, like, you know, once we turned old enough to start going into the bars, we would every Saturday night go to a bar and sit down and just have a beer together and talk about our week. How's your week been? What's going on? How are you doing? He said, but you know, as we grew older, we got married and life changed. And, you know, we sort of all ended up in separate places. So we all don't live close to each other anymore. So we decided we're going to keep that tradition alive. So every Friday, just like you saw me do, they do, or every Saturday, we all go into a bar close to the house and we all get three beers to keep that tradition alive. And the bartender's like, well, that's pretty cool. I've, I've never heard of that before. That's pretty neat. So he does this for months, so much so that he becomes a regular. The bartender knows him. The other regulars in the bar know him. And a few months later, he comes in, and he walks up to the bar. And, of course, the bartender sees him coming, so he's already got the first glass going. And he walks up to the bar, and he started on the second glass, and he goes, well, that would just be two tonight. And the bartender was like, okay. So he just pours the second one and puts it on the tray. He doesn't really ask any questions. The guy doesn't say anything. So gives him the two beers. He goes to his booth. Same exact thing. Sip out of this one, sip out of this one, back and forth until they're all gone. He comes back up to the bartender, and he gives him the glasses. The bartender is like, hey, man, I, I couldn't help but notice, and I just want to tell you I'm sorry. You don't, you don't have to tell me anything. I, I just want to tell you I'm sorry. He's like, you're, you're sorry? He goes, yes. He says, I, you don't need to tell me. I don't need to know, but my condolences for your loss. He's like, my loss? He said, yeah, you, you just ordered two beers. He goes, oh, 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 I'm sorry. My bad. I should have explained that ahead of time. Here's the reason I only ordered two beers. He said, everybody's alive. Everybody's good. My brothers are fine. See, what happened was last week, my wife and I started going to the Baptist church, so I'm not allowed to drink anymore. Um, <laughs> but my brothers are still good. So, you know. So there you go. There is always a loophole, my friends. All right, so today we are finishing up the series on Ephesians. And hadn't Pastor Dave been killing this Ephesians series? He's been doing such a phenomenal job on it. Yeah, give him a hand. Huge. And like the title slide says, the book of Ephesians is all about who we are and how we live. To kind of use Pastor Dave's words, it's all about our in Christ reality, which is who we are, and our in Charleston reality, how we live, how those two worlds blend together because they're two totally different worlds. And so we've been looking at that, and my personal belief on that is that probably the thing that we all struggled with the most is the who we are part. And if we don't get the who we are part right, then that makes life very hard and very confusing. Let me introduce you to my friend, Mr. Anderson. Many of you know Mr. Anderson, Keanu Reeves, 
from the Matrix, right? Yeah. So you know this message is already going in a good direction, right? So in the movie The Matrix, Mr. Anderson is this guy who is just in this humdrum life. I mean, it's just life is just the same old, same old. Nothing ever changes. He never gets ahead. He's always struggling. He's always, you know, something's always coming up that just life is just a fight. And this particular scene right here, he's getting chewed out by his boss because he was late showing up for work again. And there really isn't much to live for. Everybody's life is pretty much the same. And so people around him, in an effort to kind of deal with just the mundane of the everyday life, a lot of them turn to sort of psychedelic drugs that help them sort of escape just this absolutely wretched existence. Well, one day, Mr. Anderson meets this character by the name of Morpheus. And Morpheus explains to him that that's not real life. That is not who you are. You are not Mr. Anderson. Your real name is Neo. And you have an enemy that has you under a spell that is keeping you asleep to who you really are. And if you could wake up and realize who Neo is, you would realize you have access to unlimited sources and unlimited power. There's nothing you can't do. You just have to discover it. And so Neo begins this journey of discovering there's this whole other world he didn't know about. And in this other world, it is limitless. The only thing that limits him is his ability to believe this incredible limitless power and resources that he now has access to. He's had access to it his whole life, but he has an enemy that has kept him asleep to who he really is. And I love as he begins to grow and develop into who he really is. This is one of my favorite scenes where he even gets to where he can stop bullets so he's in this scene and there's a bunch of enemies and they all just emptied every weapon they have at him and he very calmly just holds up his hand and says no and all the bullets stop and when they stop they all drop to the ground And it's in that scene that one of the characters is looking and and they're observing and they're like, how in the world is he doing that? And Morpheus says, he's beginning to believe. He's learning who he is. And when he learns who he is, that supernatural evil, that wicked power that seems so big and so ominous is nothing. And that's what happens all throughout the movie. Neo learns more and more and discovers more and more who he is. And all of a sudden he realizes, man, these evil people we've been running from, they're nothing. They have no power. I can squash them with one hand. It's the neatest journey because when he first would encounter evil, there's a lot of kung fu fighting in this movie. So when he first encounters him, it's a lot of, oh, you know, he's fighting and they're fighting. Everybody's kicking and slapping, bing, 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 jumping up and down and all that. And it's pretty much a toe for toe kind of thing. And a lot of times he has to run away. But later in the movie, by the time he starts figuring out who he really is, the bad guy's still doing all that, jumping and ching chang and hing hawing and all that kind of stuff. And he's literally one hand behind his back and with the other hand just like sitting there like, man, this is boring. That's all you got? I mean, he's blocking every shot like it's effortless. Like that's as, that's as much as you can. And all of a sudden you see in the eyes of the evil person this fear. Like, who are you? And he's like, man, you don't want to mess with me. You don't want to mess with me because I'm so much more powerful and have access to so much more, way more than you could even imagine that I could do. That is the story of Neo, and I think that's our story. I think the biggest struggle for most of us is every Sunday we walk in those doors as Mr. Anderson. And I think most Sundays we walk back out those doors as Mr. Anderson. We experience a good service, hopefully. We get some good worship. Hopefully, this is a good message. And you get a little bump to your week, you know. So just Sunday becomes a time where you just get that little shot in the arm to get you to next Sunday. And you go right back into your same job, your same family, your same circumstances, your same situations. And everything is the same. And then next Sunday, you just feel a little bit better when you walk out. Just enough for it to get drained off before you make it back in the following Sunday. And that is not, that is not the life that God has for you. It is not. This is the life that God has for you. Let me, let me show you who you really are. So your name is not Mr. Anderson. Your name is not even whatever you think it is. This is what God says about you in 2 Corinthians 5.17. This means that anyone who belongs to Christ has become a new person. That word is kinokatesis, which literally means new creature. 
is what that means. A new creation, a new creature. The old life is gone, a new life has begun. The word there for begun is janomai, and it literally means to come into existence, to be born. So according to God's word, the moment you decided to believe in Jesus Christ and ask him to come into your life, you became something different. You did not become the same person who now believes in Jesus. You are not the same person. Supernaturally, you are different. Well, Eddie, I don't feel any different. I know because you have an enemy that has kept you asleep to who you really are. He doesn't have any power. He doesn't have any authority. The way he operates is in lies and deception. That's his modus operandi. That's what he does against you. So, the good news about today is the who you are and how we live, that takes up five and a half of the six chapters of Ephesians. So we're literally today only talking about eight verses in Ephesians. But if you don't understand those eight verses, the other 147 are going to be very confusing and maybe even frustrating to you. So this is the key. So here is my challenge. My challenge today is that you don't walk out of here as Mr. Anderson. Turn to your neighbor and say, call me Neo. <laughs> Poor Luke, he was in here last service, man. He just, he loves it so much when we do that. Turn to your neighbor and say that. All right, so let's start diving into these verses. We're going to look at the first four verses out of the eight that we're going to look at. This is Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 13. A final word, be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. Put on all of God's armor so that you'll be able to stand firm against all the strategies of the devil. For we're not fighting against flesh and blood enemies, but against evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world, against mighty powers in this dark world, and against evil spirits in the heavenly places. Therefore, put on every piece of God's armor so you'll be able to resist the enemy in the time of evil. Then... After the battle, you will still be standing firm. So step one to becoming who God says that you are, becoming that new person that you are, is that we need to wake up to the fact that you're in a battle. And, every, and, it, and it wages 24-7. It never stops. It is always going. And, and this is a battle against a vast network of evil. When I read those verses, those aren't a bunch of different ways to describe the same evil. What it said was evil rulers and authorities of the unseen world. Two different entities. Two different entities. Mighty powers in this dark world. That is a third entity. And evil spirits in the heavenly places. That is at least a four-tier organized system of evil that is set against you. That is warring against you. That is a reality. But here is the most important thing I'll probably say this whole message. Please hear me say this. Evil is not the opposite of God. It is the opposition to God. When you say, oh, evil is the opposite of God, you're inferring that evil is just as powerful, just as strong, and just as capable of ruining your life as God is of blessing your life. And that is the ultimate lie of the enemy. He has no power. He has no authority. Christ stripped it all from him. And not only did he strip all power and authority from the devil, he died on the cross to defeat every work of the devil. Then when he went up into heaven, he said, now I'm giving that power to you. My power lives in you. So the enemy's strategy is not to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with you. Because the real you, that new you, the new creature, the new creature who was created that came alive in Christ, the enemy is no match for that you. It's not even a contest. So what he has to do is to keep you asleep. Nothing really changed about you. That, don't listen. You're not new. I mean, look in the mirror. Do you look different? Are you feeling different? Are you thinking, see, no, there's no, that's a bunch of hogwash. That's the enemy, all designed to keep you asleep. He's not going to manifest himself in your living room and, you know, with the daggum horns and the tail and the red thing and the triad or whatever. You know, but that's not what he's going to do. No, because I'm telling you, he is no match for you. It is not even a contest but for all of us, 
for all of us. That, that who we really are sleeps on the inside, which is a cue for my second favorite movie, which is Dune. I don't know how many of you have seen Dune. I'm going to refer back to the original Dune because it's better, not because I'm older, but because it is. So in the original Dune, you have Paul Atreides played by this guy, a little bit different actor. But the story is the same. And the story of, of Dune is that there's this planet called Arrakis. And on Arrakis, there's this tremendous amount of resources. And so you have all of these different quote-unquote families um, that sort of preside over the universe. And they kind of take turns ruling over Arrakis. And at this particular time, the Harkonnen family is ruling Arrak Arrakis. And they're very evil and they're very corrupt and they're very oppressive towards the people who live on Arrakis. And so the families get together and they say, you know what, you're out. We're going to let the house of Atreides come in. And this is Paul Atreides, who is the son of Duke Leto Atreides, the leader of the family. So they make all the arrangements. The Harkonnens evacuate. The Atreides come in. They're much nicer, much more peaceful, much more respectful of the planet and the people that live there. But wouldn't you know it, the Harkonnens just left behind some snares and some traps. And what ends up happening is the Harkonnens spring their trap of rebellion. They kill almost every member of the house of Atreides. And Paul now has to escape out into the desert where he now becomes a freedom fighter with the people who live on Arrakis. So now the Harkonnen, the evil house of the Harkonnens is back in power, back in control. And Paul is fighting along with the people who live on Arrakis. And it's really an unfair fight. It's good versus evil, but the Harkonnens are much more powerful, much bigger in number. But it's during this physical fight, this physical battle, that Paul starts learning something about the supernatural. Some people begin to talk to him and say, Paul... Look, this is a distraction. This, this whole thing, this battle, this fight, it could be over like that. And here's how. There's something sleeping on the inside of you. And it's something supernatural. I know you think that your name is Paul Atreides. You are not Paul Atreides. You have another name in the supernatural. And we've seen it and we know who you are. And if you would just awaken to who you really are, you could put an end to all of it today. The sleeper must awaken Paul. And so he hears this long enough, and he finally says, you know what, I'm going to investigate it. And he takes place in a ceremony, and his eyes are open to the supernatural, and he sees who he really is. And when he sees who he really is, he goes in and single-handedly in the palace defeats the Harkonnen's most fiercest warrior. Defeats him, hands down, no problem. And then they come and they put the royal robe on him and they call him by his new name. He's no longer Paul Atreides, just like Mr. Anderson becomes Neo, Paul Atreides becomes Muad'Dib. That's a cool sounding name, Muad'Dib. And so this is what the narrator of the movie says in this final scene. Once the evil has been vanquished, this is the narrator's words. Where there was war, Muad'Dib would now bring peace. Where there was hatred... He would bring love to lead the people to true freedom and to change the face of Arrakis. Just like you and I, just like these movies are saying, there's something great on the inside of you. God has declared it. God has said it. But you do have an enemy trying to keep you asleep. Turn to your neighbor and say, the sleeper must awaken. See, I don't give you something easy to say. I give you something good and awkward. I know that's awkward. And I notice a lot of y'all didn't put near as much dramatic flair on yours as I had on mine. But that's all right. We'll move on. We will move on. All right. So that's the first half. We have eight verses. The first half of those verses are trying to get us to see you are in a supernatural battle. It's not flesh and blood. It's not people. No person is your enemy. There's a supernatural force that is your enemy. And that supernatural force is not an equal to you. It's subservient to you. But it's deceived you into thinking that it's more powerful than you are. It's deceived you into thinking that there's nothing that you can do. It's deceived you into thinking that this is all there is, that your life will never amount to anything. That is not true. You have to awaken to the truth. And so here's kind of the dilemma when you start talking about spiritual warfare and what we're about to get in right now, which is the armor of God. If you've been around church very long, you've probably heard that term, these next four verses are the armor of God. When you hear that spiritual warfare and armor of God, it paints a picture of your mind of, of you charging into a battle and, and just taking your Bible and just wiping the fire out of anything that gets in your way. And that's really not what it is. 
Like everything that God does, he just does things differently than we do. His method, his method for bringing light into the darkness is to get you to wake up to who he is and who you are. And now because of who you are, now you bring his nature and his character into every dark situation of your life. And you literally change those situations and those circumstances. So how do we do that? Well, let's start off looking at the different pieces of the armor. We're going to take them verse by verse. Verse 14 says, Stand your ground, putting on the belt of truth and the body armor of God's righteousness. Some translations say the breastplate of righteousness. This is an important place to start. Why start first with the belt? Well, because the belt holds everything together. That's why it is the belt of truth. Well, Eddie, what is truth? Isn't truth just relative? I mean, I get what you believe truth is, but that's truth according to you. What is the real truth? I'm going to help you out right here. There are only two answers to every question in the universe. In the universe, two answers. God's answer and everybody else's. And everybody else is wrong. I mean, that's just the way it is. I I don't know how to put it much more simpler than that. Truth is what God says. That is the truth, and we need to buy into that wholeheartedly, especially when it comes to who we are and our righteousness. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 5.21. For God made Christ, who never sinned, to be the offering for our sin so that we could be made right with God through Christ. Period. End of story. Nothing else. No I's to dot, no T's to cross, no check boxes to check. You can't get any more right with God. But I don't think most of us understand that. I think you believe it sitting here listening now. But I'm talking about five hours from now or eight hours from now or in the heat of the crisis. It's going to happen this week. Whenever I don't think very many of us walk around 24-7 conscious of, man, me and God are tight and I'm right. I mean, we just tighten and right. You know, me and God, boom, we're there because of what Jesus did. But that's exactly what that verse says. That verse says you can't, you can't, you can't add any, you can't get any more right. There's nothing else for you to do. You can't do anything. You don't believe me? Ephesians 2, 8 through 10. God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for this. It is a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for the good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. For we are God's masterpiece, and he has created us anew, again, that word means a new creature, in Christ Jesus, so we can do the good things he planned for us long ago. You are as right with God as you are ever going to get, and you can't mess that up. You can't mess it up. You are right. You and God are tight, and you're right, and you're good to go. And you have a new name, and you're a new person, regardless of what you think or how you feel. That's according to the truth of what God says about you. And we're going to work on getting to where God says about us. So once now we know that we have the truth, we're made right, we have this righteousness from God, it's time to do something, which is why I think God said, you know what, now we need some shoes because now we're going to do something. So verse 15, for shoes, put on the peace that comes from the good news so that you will be fully prepared. So what does it look like to put on the shoes of peace, of the good news of the gospel? Man, what, what kind of ethereal thing is that? It's very simple. It's very practical. It looks a lot like the team that went to Guatemala, the team that just got back from that missions trip. It looks a lot like going somewhere into an area that is impoverished, where people are hopeless, where people really can't provide for their own basic needs and bringing to them what they need, bringing them medicine, bringing them clean water, bringing them items of clothing, bringing to them things that they're not capable of getting on their own. That is the shoes of the good news of the gospel of peace that comes into that situation. Well, Eddie, I can't, you know, I work a lot, so I really can't afford to do like missions trips and all that. Sure you can. You do missions trips every single day. Every day we all wake up with unlimited missions in front of us. First thing you could do is just be nice. Be a kind person. You could be the person who, when you get to work and all you know what breaks loose and it's chaotic and it's hectic and everybody is freaking out, you come in and you're just calm. And you bring something different. You bring peace. You can be the person who just happens to notice a need in somebody else who says, you know what, I can do something about that. 
and then you do something about that. We all have unlimited opportunities for missions every single day of our life. Every single day of our life. Ephesians 6, 16. In addition to all of these, hold up the shield of faith to stop the fiery arrows of the devil. So in addition to all these, so so far we've got the belt of truth, the body armor of righteousness. We've got the shoes of the gospel of peace on our feet. And now he says, hold up the shield of faith because the enemy has Fiery arrows. Now, why would God say fiery? Well, I would love to tell you, but we don't know. We have no idea why he chose fiery, but it makes a lot of sense. And I was listening to uh, Dr. Tony Evans, who did a sermon on the, um, on the armor of God for Dallas Theological Seminary, and he had a great analogy. And I said, man, I'm ripping that off. I'm going to do the Christian thing and steal his analogy. Because it was just so good. Because I know if I asked him, he'd say, absolutely, you use it. But I've given him credit, so it's his anyway. This was his thought of, could this possibly be why he chose fiery arrows? And he chose, again, like I did in the beginning of the service, to go back to the days of the pioneers moving across the country. And the way that happened was you had women and children and, and supplies in these canvas-covered wagons called a wagon train. And the cowboys, the men, were riding on horseback around with their guns to protect them. And if they encountered hostile Indians, then they would circle the wagons in the middle and the cowboys would ride around the outside edge. Now, they have guns. The Indians have arrows. An arrow is no match for a gun unless you have an Indian that says, well, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to dip my arrow in some oil and light it on fire. Why? Not to kill the cowboy. You don't need the fire on the arrow to kill the cowboy. If you hit the cowboy with the arrow, he's going to die. But if you can take that flaming arrow and shoot it over the head of that cowboy and get lucky and hit one of those wagons and catch it on fire, now there's a distraction. Now the cowboys can't just focus on fighting the enemy. They have to turn and go and immediately put out this fire because that's where the women and the children are, all of our supplies. Now I'm distracted and now I'm vulnerable. Now the enemy has the edge because I've given in to that distraction. That's a pretty good analogy, right? Yeah, it is. Some of y'all got that. But I chose this point in the service to give you a little bit of a boost of energy because somebody sent this video to me on Facebook that takes this exact same analogy but puts it in more modern day vernacular. So something that you, every I'm going to tell you, everybody in this room is going to be able to identify with what this young man is saying. And plus, he has just a a little bit, just a little bit more passion and energy than I do right now. Okay, so take a look at this. He said, I need your eyes on me. He said, don't look at your storm. Don't look at what's happening. Don't look at the job loss. Don't look at the diagnosis. Nah, don't look at the depression. Don't look at the divorce. Don't look at the kids wilding out. Don't look at everything that's going wrong. He said, what you looking at? Don't look at the people that left. Let them go. Don't look at the people that won't come back. Let them stay. He said, when Peter walked on water, he was looking at me. He said, when Peter walked on water, when Peter did the impossible, when Peter was able to do the supernatural, he was looking at me. His eyes was on his creator. His eyes was on his strength. His eyes was on his way maker. His eyes was on his way out. His eyes was on his way through. But when he looked down, (laughs) he said, when Peter looked around, when he started watching the storm, when he started looking at the water, when he started to think, how am I doing? what I'm doing, he began to say, when you look at your storm, that's when the storm will take you under. When you look at your storm, your storm will consume you. He said, keep your eyes on me, my child, and you'll do the supernatural. You'll do the impossible. Everything that they say won't happen will happen if you just look at me. So what you looking at? What you looking at? Keep your eyes on my word. Speak my promises. Yes and amen. And do the impossible. I mean, that's just a drop the mic and walk away, right? I mean, what can you add to that? But we're going to add to it. All right, because we got one more verse, and this last verse gives us the last two pieces of the armor. And it's verse 17. It says, put on salvation as your helmet and take the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now, helmet for salvation, that makes sense, right? Because the most vital part of your body is your head. 
I mean, you know, I've watched Monty Python. You can fight without an arm. You can fight without a leg. You can fight without, those are just flesh wounds, just a flesh wound. You know, you can fight without those things. You can't fight without your head. If you lose your head, battle's over, right? So it makes sense that the first and foremost thing you need to settle is your salvation and make Jesus Christ your Lord and your Savior, which is very easy because the Bible says if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe with all your heart God raised him from the dead, you will be saved. There's lots of times in here we say, hey, raise your hand if you want to accept Christ as your Savior. But I can tell you if you're in here today and by the time we get to this message, you're like, man, I want to get on board. That's all you have to do. You can do that driving home in your car. You can do that before you go to bed tonight. You can do that before you even leave your seat. You can under your breath right now say, Jesus, I believe in you. I believe in you, and I want you to come into my life. And that's a done deal. All that is required is for you to believe in who Jesus is. So once you settle that, now we're down to the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God, which, again, a lot of people teach this, and it's not wrong that now, oh, the sword is the offensive weapon. The sword, now, that's what I'm going to go. I'm destiny. I'm going to go get up in there with my, mm, I'm going to get a clean house. With the sword of the Spirit. And you know what? There are times to do that. There really are. There absolutely are times to do that. But I think, as is typical of God, that the majority of the time, what he's talking about is a word that is just, it's different. The Bible is just, it is just, it is different. It is the truth of what God says, and it is different. And here's how it's different in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. For the word of God is alive and powerful. It is sharper than the sharpest two-edged sword, cutting between soul and spirit, between joint and marrow. It exposes our innermost thoughts and desires. According to God, when you interact with his word, it changes you. God says that when you read my word, it goes in and it does something. It's alive and it's living. The problem is, I think, for most of us, the, the only exposure we have to the word of God is coming in here on a Sunday and seeing somebody put it up on the screen. And there's nothing wrong with that at all. Man, I'm glad you're here. But this little bit that you're getting here this Sunday is not going to be enough to carry you to next Sunday. I mean, unless you just want to be Mr. Anderson and just the doldrums of life and day in and day out and the same old. It'll, it'll do that for you. It'll give you a little pick-me-up. But it's not going to change your life. But if you really get into it, According to God, that word goes into you and it accomplishes exactly what he's told it to accomplish. And I got a great example of that this week. On Monday morning, somebody reached out to me through Facebook. Somebody I haven't seen in over 25 years. His name is Yosef. And when Yosef was at Cathedral, he was in the children's ministry. And when he was in the children's ministry, I was his camp counselor at Camp Chattooga on the Chattooga River. So I had Chris Profader, and, and I had Yosef, and I had all these guys, a cool little group of young men. Um, and I've watched Chris just like, I, I love watching Chris. He's amazing. But Chris is still here. Yosef left. So Yosef was here through children's ministry. And then in teens, my wife and I were leaders in the teens ministry, and, and I got really close with Yosef. But then his father being in the military, they moved away. And I always had a concern about Yosef because Yosef was extremely intelligent. He was a highly intellectual young man. He did not just go with the flow of what everybody else said. He did not just follow any given person, just highly intellectual. And I worry about people like that when it comes to being able to yield themselves to the Word of God. And so my, my prayer for Yosef was always, man, Lord, don't let, him, don't let him go anywhere. Don't let him stray away. But as fate would have it, I come to find out Monday that not long after he left here and he turned 18 and he was an adult and could do what he wanted to do, he walked away from the church because he didn't feel like the church really was very relevant to his life. And so as we're talking, he, said, he sends me this note and he says, hey, Eddie, I know you haven't heard from me in a long time and this might sound kind of weird, but I need some resources and I thought you might be able to help me. And the resources were these Christian resources that we're talking. And he said, yeah, I just got saved not too long ago. So then I'm like, okay, well, that's interesting. So, you know, kind of tell me your story. This is Yosef, by the way, with his young son. And, um, and so Yosef, in this picture, he's in a kitchen cooking for the members of the Baha'i faith. He had become a Baha'i, B-A-H-A-I. If you don't know what Baha'i are, Baha'i is a religion that believes, yes, there is only one God. And he is all-powerful and all-supreme, omniscient, omnipresent. However... He's not, he's not like a personal, intimate God. And the way we know about this all-powerful, all-knowing God is we see a little bit of him in every religion. So all religions are showing us a side of the one true God. That's what they believe. 
Basically, they believe that, well, all religions, you know, get you there. They point to the right place. So he's telling me, he said, I've been a Baha'i for the last 14 years. And I was like, well, how in the world did you become a Christian? And he told me exactly how, so I want to read you his words. He said, one day I read a Baha'i book called A Thief in the Night, a book written to convince Christians to become Baha'i. I was so amazed with the author's knowledge of the Bible, I decided I would become a better Baha'i by finally reading the entire Bible. Four months later, I was finished and greatly agitated. I can only describe it as the Holy Spirit having convicted me, but I was not ready to face what that meant. So next, I read the Quran. I barely made it halfway through before I realized the Quran is not describing the same God as the Bible. Then I went back into my Baha'i writings and realized they're not talking about the same Jesus of the Bible, and they're definitely not describing the same gospel of the Bible. Long story short, last year I read the Bible cover to cover in an attempt to become a better Baha'i, but wouldn't you know it, instead... I walked away knowing that Jesus Christ is my Lord and Savior. What? Man. Nobody witnessed to him. I mean, I love that he's like, you know what? And, and this so matches his personality that he would not want to be fake. And so when he reads this person that has knowledge of the Bible, and he's like, you know what? If I'm going to be a true, a true Baha'i, I need to know what these other religions think. So on his own, sets out and gets into the Bible. And the problem with that is that word right there is alive and living. It's not just words on a page. And four months later, he finds himself given his life to the Lord. There's something about this interaction with the Word. And here lately, I have seen firsthand some things going on that have just blown my mind. So early last year, a group of us went down to a church in Florida, and they had something in that church called My Freedom. It was a small group curriculum. And I knew it was important because, like us, they have a growth track, a four-week growth track that everybody has to go through who wants to you know, participate at the next level in the church. But then once they finish the growth track, they sign up for another six weeks of this My Freedom thing. So I'm talking to the leaders. I'm like, dude, y'all just turned four weeks into ten. Like, like, is that worth it? I mean, that, that seems like a lot to give up. And he said, oh, man. He said, if you ever see what somebody looks like at the end of those six weeks after My Freedom, he said, it's life changing. And he said, for them to come into ministry in the church completely, radically changed, oh yeah, it's worth the extra six weeks. So we bring it back and we start diving into it and it looks really, really good. And so I decided, hey, let's do an experiment with this. So the end of last year, the last small group semester, um, I have a group called Next Level Men. And I said, I'm going to use that curriculum in there. So we did that curriculum. We started that group that semester with 50 men. Now, if you start a small or a group with men, typically by the time you get to the end of six or eight weeks, if you've got 50, you're doing good if you end up with 35 to 40. That, that would be considered success because there's just an attrition right there. You know, they lose interest or life just happens, really. Life just happens and things distract them and take them away. We started with 50. We ended with 50. I think there was two guys who didn't make every single week just because of things that were out of their control. Right then, I was like, okay, that's speaking volumes. And then I start watching these guys, and they are having, I, don't, I, I can't think of another way to say it other than to say it's radical change. It, you know, when I got saved, I had a radical salvation. It was like immediate. There was a lot. Of, I became that new creation. I was very much aware of that because it was so radical. But then sometimes you lose sight of this, what happens over time as you're interacting with God. And I'm watching these 50 men, and man, they are having major, major life change. And it doesn't matter where they're at. There, I, had, I had a guy in there that didn't even, wasn't even a Christian. He hadn't even decided yet whether he wanted to believe this whole God thing. He was like 20, 21 years old. And yet he's going through this curriculum that has him in the Bible, and the way it's done, he totally understands what it's saying, and he's interacting with it, and it's changing him. Then I've got older people that have been in this church as long as I have. And I want to read you a quote from one of them. He was in in the 9 o'clock service. He's been a part of Cathedral for over 35 years. 
he had major change in that group. And so I sat down with him and I was like, man, what, like, what do you think it was? And he was like, I, I don't know. He said, I can't tell you like, oh, this is how God did it. And this is what he said. This is a quote from him. My best guess as to how this happened is that I finally engaged with God. I've been sitting in these chairs for over 30 years, same chairs you're sitting in right now. And how many times have they said from the stage, get engaged with God. Don't let this just be a Sunday thing. So I did. My interpretation of what he said, for 35 years I've walked in those doors of Mr. Anderson and I've walked out those doors of Mr. Anderson. I am not Mr. Anderson anymore. I mean, it really is. It really is watching, like watching Neo. It really is like watching Wadib. I mean, I'm looking at a man in front of my eyes who is literally changing. You can even see it in his eyes. It's like there's life and light in his eyes because he was one of those people, like Mr. Anderson, that man, he, just, he struggled terribly with anxiety. This guy's retirement age and has struggled with extreme anxiety his whole life. And in six weeks, his anxiety was gone. And the things that he used to cope with that anxiety, quit cold turkey. Doesn't mess with it anymore. Doesn't need it anymore. If you talk to his wife and his family, they're like, man, we don't know what's going on. Like, he is changed. But what's going on is he's just been interacting with that word. So we had such radical transformation there. We were like, okay, hey, this year, so at the start of this group semester, which is winding down right now, we approached several of our just normal small group leaders, not just men, but men and women, and said, would you consider doing this curriculum? We just want to see, like, is this a, a one-off thing, or is this, like, does it really keep going? So other small groups did it, and then I took the same group of 50 men right back through it again. And across the board, radical, deep, lasting change. And it's not anything. It's no teacher. It's no preacher. There's no teaching. There's no preaching. It is a curriculum that gets you into this word in a way that wakes you up as to who you really are and how God really feels about you. And when you learn who you really are and how God really feels about you, that level of love radically changes your life. And here's what I'm super jacked up about. So we did it with the men. We did it with some of the small groups. It is so big. It's been so impactful that our series after Easter is going to be my freedom, and we're taking everybody through it, the whole church. Yes, that is something to celebrate. So right after Easter, we're going to do My Freedom as a whole church. The Sunday services will center around those My Freedom topics. And then every Wednesday night, we'll come in here on the church campus and break off into small groups and discuss the My Freedom material. And I'm going to tell you, it will radically change your life. So I'm super, super stoked about that. All right, now we're wrapping up. i got to take it back to the Matrix to wrap it up. There's just no better movie. So I told you about the change in Neo, but I want to go back to a scene that was very critical for Neo slash Mr. Anderson. And in this scene, Morpheus sits down with Neo. And he says, all right, Neo, I've shown you the truth. I've shown you that there's this whole other world that exists. That as Mr. Anderson, you couldn't see it, but now you know it's real. I've shown it to you. And you see that it's real, but now you've got to make a decision. And Morpheus opens up his hands and he has two pills. Blue pill and a red pill. He said, so here's the deal. You can take the blue pill. And tomorrow morning you'll wake up in your bed. You won't remember any of this. You'll be the same old Mr. Anderson you've always been. And your conundrum hamster wheel life will just keep going on and on and on. And you'll be none the wiser. Or you can take this red pill. And if you take this red pill, I will journey with you. And I will begin to reveal to you the access and the ability and the power and the resources that you have. And you're only going to get stronger and stronger and stronger. And Neo, as you get stronger and stronger and stronger, you are going to set other people free, which is what you and I do. 
You weren't called to live out this life with this life just beating the fire out of you. You were called to live a life called by God with the living light of God in you. You have the spirit of the living God in you. And you take that light, that life out into that wicked, evil world. And you bring light into the darkness. That is your role. That is your job. That is your mission. And you are fully capable and fully able. And it's not about anything that you can do. It is about what God has already done. So this is my challenge to you. You can take the blue pill. And you could walk out of here today still being Mr. Anderson. Hopefully this has inspired you a little bit. I know the worship music was good. And and you're probably feeling good right now. And you can be all cozied up in your goodness right now. And hey, that'll last for a little while. We'll see. Some of it might last till Wednesday. Most of it probably won't last past Monday at lunch. Most of it will leave you as soon as you walk through work. Like, oh, just gone. Like, uh, there it is right there. You just step through the door at work, and all of a sudden the junk is just all up on you. That's the blue pill. Or you can take the red pill. And you can say, you know what, man, just like that guy who's been sitting in here forever, that's me, man. I, I, you know, I can't tell you how. Maybe it's not been here. Maybe it's just been church, period. Maybe you say, man, I, I, I believe this stuff since I was a kid. But if I were being totally honest, I just don't see a lot of change in my life. And if that's you, and you say, I want to take that red pill. I want to engage with God's word. I want to engage in a way that I will forever be altered. I got two things you can do. You can do either one of them. I hope you'll do both of them. And they're very practical. The first thing you can do is if you say, man, I I need that. I need that change. I want to be a part of that. You can simply text FREEDOM to 97000. And that will get you more information. That is not a commitment to join it. That is not you saying, I'm going to do it. It is just, I want to know more. And we'll send you more information about the My Freedom that's happening after Easter. That's one thing you could do very easy scan the QR code the other thing you can do is on your way out guest services are going to be there with buckets with Easter invite cards in them we want you to take as many of those cards as you think people that you can invite take take more than you need don't run out that is a very real and practical way to change somebody's life I'm telling you, your simple ask of inviting somebody to Easter service, you could be the reason that a marriage doesn't fall apart. You could be the reason that a mom or dad comes back into the home where the children are and the family is reunited. You could be the reason that somebody who is absolutely at their wits end and about to pull the plug themselves decides, no, maybe there is something to live for. You could be the person that alters destinies for generations. Not just here, not just now, but something that has a ripple effect that changes families and generations of families for years to come simply by inviting somebody to come to an Easter service. You can do that. So two options to take the red pill. And again, I hope you'll do both. Stand with me if you would. So I want to bless you as you're heading out here today. I want to bless you with, man, your name's not Anderson. Your name's not Mr. Anderson. You've got it. You know a really cool thing that the book of Revelation says that when you and I get to heaven, there's going to be a moment that God walks up to you and he has these white stones. There's one for everybody, everybody, for every person that's ever existed. And he's going to hand that white stone to you. And you know what's on that white stone? Your real name. It's a name that he knows you by. It's a name that he sees in you right now. It is the sleeper that is asleep on the inside of you, and he wants it to awaken. He wants it to come alive. He wants you to experience that new name in this life here and now, and you can do that by simply saying yes. I want to bless you with the fact that you are carrying the spirit of the living God in your heart. You are carrying the light that through your love, your joy, your peace, your patience, your kindness, your gentleness, your self-control goes out into the darkness of the this world and absolutely brings in the light and the love of God everywhere you go. The warfare is not that you got to strap up and charge in. The warfare is that you just got to get up and believe what God says and then walk out hanging on to what God says about who you are and what you can do and who he is and what he will do and that he wants to use you to do it. You, my friends, are carrying the light of the world on the inside of you, the hope of Jesus Christ. I bless you with that awareness. Have a great week, and we'll see you next Sunday. Have a great day.